Next up, we've got uh, John and Dimitri from the Basil team to give a project update. Let's welcome John and Dimitri. Guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to see uh, a bunch of friendly faces. Um, uh, Chernobyl is a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> and uh, for better or for worse, we're not going to talk a lot about our most spectacular failures. Maybe in the break, you can ask us about those. Um, but I do uh, uh, want to talk about a bunch of things that are relevant. Uh, just by quick way of introduction, uh, I manage the Basel team. Uh, which is largely split between New York and Munich. We now have uh, some folks in the Bay Area as well. Um, so I'm Dimitri. I manage the Munich part of the Basel team. I spend a lot of time with Basel 1.0 and just mention the Basel project in general. Thanks, Dimitri. All right, so uh, let's get going. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the path to Basel 1.0. And after Jeff's um, characterization of 1.0, um, I will say that our 1.0 is a little different, I think, from other 1.0s because it was our, uh, um, as many of you know, uh, Bazel is known internally at Google as Blaze. We've been working with Blaze, uh, Blaze for a number of years. Bazel 1.0 was our um, manifestation of our open source Bazel, uh, and it, it was a set of requirements we, need, we felt the community needed in order for us to announce 1.0. So I think it's maybe closer to a 2.0, probably not the 3.0 level of uh, polish that Jeff was alluding to, but maybe a little more than the kind of 1.0 everybody is sort of uh, wants to move on. So I wanted to review a little bit uh, the path to 1.0, which mostly is covering uh, some changes the Bazel team has been working on since the last BaselCon. A few things started before that. And just uh, go over those, and then we'll talk about the future a little bit. So uh, let's start with processes and practices. One of the bits of feedback we heard from a lot of users was, hey, you're making a lot of changes at head. That's great. We can't keep up. You're making a lot of releases. We can't keep up. There are a lot of changes. You're breaking us a lot. We heard that feedback. And we've gone to a semantic versioning style, so conventional semantic versioning style 1.0. Um, establishes the first semantically version release. Each uh, major release is then going to be an, uh, potentially incompatible changes from the previous releases. So we're now going to a more conventional process uh, for managing changes in that respect. And we've introduced what we call the incompatible change policy. We want to give folks advance notice of breaking changes under flag uh, special uh, stylized flags. You have the opportunity to test these changes in advance if you wish, and there are nice mechanisms to do that. And then at the next release, after a three month or so period, uh, we will flip those flags, but you've had some fair warning to get on board with that. So I think that's a, that's a structured change to enable us to work quickly ahead, to, build, to, to make changes fast, but hopefully not to break you. Um, we've improved our bug triage and response internally. Um, we still miss a few things, but we've, uh, we're trying to be more responsive, more systematic in response policy, and hopefully you've seen this. We've greatly improved our CI process. It's an open process. You can see our CI online. We've invited folks who want their projects to track against head to uh, onboard their projects into our CI, so we can, we can use that to help gauge how, we're, how well we're doing. We've introduced what we call an incompatible change pipeline, which enables us to see how potential future changes that will be in the next major release uh, are, uh, affect you. So our CI pipeline has improved, and we're onboarding a bunch of other projects that aren't our own to test how well our changes are working. We have a new installer for Bazel called Bazelisk that allows you to control when changes show up, whether you want to get Bazel from head or get a certain version. We've reduced the binary size that has advantages for a lot of purposes. So this is all sort of, you know, kind of process stuff, but we think it's important to make Bazel a more reliable and more usable product, less of a beta. Okay, configurability, not everyone touches this. If you're just a user, you may not know about this, but if you're writing rules and extending the system, we provide a mechanism to enable you to, to uh, support multiple platforms. So for example, we've introduced these concepts called platforms and tool chains internally. So when you're writing new rules, you can make them multi-platform in a nice way. And this is all available from Starlark. Also, the so-called build configuration, which allows you to do different things depending on whether you're building a, something for a, a tool or building something that you're targeting as an, as an output. These ki this kind of flexibility is now enabled in Starlark. It used to be previously only native rules had this, uh, th these fu this functionality. So now you can write multi-platform rules much more easily in Starlark and evolve them quickly. 
Uh, we've made a bunch of upgrades to our C++ and Java support. Um, C++ tool chains are incredibly complicated. For those who deal with C++, hopefully you're aware of this. Uh, there's a concept in uh, Bazel called cross tool, which is our configuration mechanism for, for C++. Previously, there was a bit of an arcane internal way to configure cross tools. Now this is all part of Starlark, so there's nothing special you need to know. I mean, configuration is still a hard problem, but uh, at least the barriers to entry for configuring a new uh, C++ tool chain have, have diminished. Uh, we now support multiple JDKs for Java. That's obviously useful for folks who have to worry about the differences between JDKs. We've done a lot of work, a ton of work, to refactor our code, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to what we call internally the sandwich APIs. And that means while we still have some rule code and native code in Java, we, make, we expose that Java functionality, that native functionality, in a controlled way to enable other rules, say Scala rules that need to access Java or other JVM compliant languages, can do that in a controlled way. So a lot of our internal APIs have been cleaned up and we hope make more, made more developer friendly to make the system easier to extend. Um, We've done a lot of work over the past year or so enabling gradual adoption of Bazel. So you don't necessarily have to move every part of your build or at least a, a particular system to Bazel all at once. We recognize that people often want to say, build their dependencies using the native system, whatever build system that use, be it make or something else, and then reference those dependencies in a Bazel build perhaps for their own project. So this is still, uh, ongoing work to do this in a really nice, clean, general way, but we've had some proof points here that show that you can do this. So for, um, for Maven integration, we have a way to do that, to access Maven uh, builds for NPN, for Node, you can do that. You can run CMake as a, as a, as a subprocess for Bazel in a controlled way. So we recognize that people who want to move to Bazel don't want to just jump in and do everything all at once, and if you don't, we provided support for that. Uh, remote execution is a, is a key bit of functionality for Bazel. We've done a lot of work to, to um, make remote execution even, I think, more attractive. The build without the bytes work is work that minimizes the amount of data transfer needed to do a remote execution, and it makes things like interactive development, I think in particular, uh, more feasible than it would be otherwise, uh, because it minimizes the amount of data transfer, minimizes the network load. We've also simplified configuration of remote builds, uh, fewer flags needed, fewer, less cruft, less complexity. So um, the barrier to entry for remote execution is hopefully lower. <coughs> Windows support, we've made some big changes there. Previously it used msys. There were vestiges of Linux floating around. Those are gone. Bash is gone. Uh, so Windows is now more of a native platform for, for, for Bazel. Um, and we've added remote execution support as well. Uh, on the performance side, we've done a lot of work to make it easier for people to understand their build performance. Um, we have a new benchmarking tool called Bazel Bench, uh, which is available for anyone, a great tool to, to try to understand how particular classes of builds are performing. Um, we have a nice profiler that's compatible with the Chrome development tools. You'll get nice, very colorful profiles to understand what's going on in your build. Uh, for those who know that the sort of the, the assembly language, the output, of Bazel is basically what we call an action graph. We provide a way to query that. So a lot of tools to enable uh, you to un better understand performance and, and to optimize your performance. Uh, there's still work to be done there, but we think that's now less of a black box. And performance is obviously important. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dimitri to talk a little bit about who is using Bazel and our next steps. So. Sure. Thanks, John. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this has been a journey as uh, John John outlined about the Bazel 1.0. Just this was just some highlights. We did a lot of other things to to get to, you know, better Bazel 1.0. And definitely, we see a lot of adoption externally, right? So this is just a sample of uh, of uh, companies using Bazel. And of course, the attendance on Bazel Corn is now twice as much, I think, or something like this, uh, over the last year. So there is there is definitely a lot of momentum around Bazel externally. And at the same time, we see a lot of momentum at Google as well, right? Basil, Basil Blaze has always been a critical part of the infrastructure, and Blaze continues to be this. And Blaze and Basil, Blaze, if you don't know, if the original tool that's still used as, you know, as a build, uh, as a thing that builds the whole of Google. 
And Blaze and Bazel, as you probably know already, share a lot of code base, all of the code base almost, right? There's some parts that are specific to Blaze Bazel, but it's still, it's the same team, same code base, and that's extremely important part of the Google's infrastructure. And we also see an uptick, a strong uptick on usage of Bazel open source, not just Blaze the tool, Blaze the tool is used by everybody at Google, but there's also a lot of, a lot of adoption of Bazel itself. Obviously, the open source projects that you see here, AppSale, Angular, and Voice Kubernetes, TensorFlow, continue using Bazel, we continue supporting them, and we have a lot of uh, other projects that are looking at Bazel, maybe adopting Bazel, and so on. So this, is, this, has, this has been a pretty strong year for us in terms of both the external adoption and the internal part of that, the interest at Google for, for, for the project, right? So I think the, uh, and now we are, we are done, right? We, we, we are done with 1.0. We had this sort of, I don't know if you've seen the level of commits, the number of changes we've been doing. We had maybe several compatible changes every single month. Uh, we had a lot of, a lot of features. We did, we did a lot of work to, to get Bazel to the point where it's a, it's a good system. It's a system that, that works for a lot of customers, and we see this adoption thing. And now, when we think about what the, what the future is, right, the key point here is this. We have put a lot of work and thought into Bazel. It, it's, the use just continues, uh, use continues, but we see this as we cannot do everything. There's a, if you look at just a number of BZL files on GitHub, over, over just this last year, it's threefold increase, right? From 25,000 to almost uh, 100,000. So the community really embraces, the, uh, embraces Bazel, and what's important here is the, yeah, it's, it's Bazel files, is you're, you're not just building, you're contributing to the, uh, to the ecosystem. You're creating something that other people probably can use, you're creating some rules, maybe you can have some macros, something like this, right? So, what we want to see is this kind of, we cannot do everything. The, the, uh, here's this, several projects. It's just an example of what the community was able to deliver. And you can see that Google has no particular expertise in Scala, nothing in Rust. Well, Kotlin, there is some, but you know, this, it's kind of going on and on. But, and, but it just started a year ago. And Haskell is like, we don't, we don't do Haskell. Like, we'll do a little bit of Haskell, but not, not, not in the, you know, <laughs> not, in the <laughs> not in the big way, right? So basically, really, sort of, for the future growth of Bazel, we cannot do everything. We, and we, we provide this foundation that the community, we hope, will build on. And our strong focus in the future We'll be, we, we've been doing this before, but we will do it even stronger, enabling the community, making sure Bazel as a product works for the community and the community can add and extend, uh, add to Bazel, extend Bazel in, in the right way, in such a way that it's all productive and frictionless, right? So here's some things we, are, we are definitely want to continue to do. We definitely want to continue the stability and the compatible change, change uh, policy thing, right? So we, we might adjust some parameters on that, depending on you know, what, where the feedback comes from and what's not, what's not. But basically, this is, I think, this is a good foundation where we go to a stable, supported thing, right? And the same thing with Bazel CI, that's a, that's a tool for us. That's also a tool, to some extent, for people who do rules and people who extend their system so that if they're on board to the Bazel CI, they will be able to you know, test against the future release of Bazel, test their stuff, uh, do things around releases and so on. That, that's the key thing. Uh, around sort of enabling, enabling Bazel system more, our ideas are around supporting these recommended rule sets, which is, you know, there is a set of criteria that if the rule set satisfies those, then they get to be on the Bazel CI, we get to have some contract between, uh, between the Bazel team and the rule owners about Asked to break them, giving them advanced ties, and so on. And you can read all that. And it's basically an open process. You can apply kind of for that, and and it will get you on board. Uh, so we also want, we've heard a lot of feedback about difficulty of managing dependencies, right? And especially for the foundational pieces of the ecosystem, we would like to continue exploring this basal federation idea. We kind of had a start with that. We we have not really. Just really delivered that yet, but I think we'll, we'll get to that and we'll have a talk later, later today about this. But basically the idea there being that uh, we want to simplify the release process for uh, parts of the ecosystem, where the ecosystem can participate in the federation and the releases will kind of happen for you automatically and, and it will be the good release so that it will work across, across the different dependencies that we have. 
And of course, one other effort that I've been uh, pushing forward is stepping up this uh, Basel Community Experts Program, where that would be companies, consultancies, or maybe individuals who are recognized as experts, who will get to get to some, go some trainings, and uh, who kind of can help companies and projects on board to Basel, help with support and this kind of thing. So we, we kind of want to work on this. Uh, Basel team cannot really support every single project that's out there. We want to expand that. We want to expand that to uh, community as well, and the community being individual people and community being companies, and, and uh, hopefully maybe even some business will come out of that, right? So that, that's, the, that's what we mean by enable Basel ecosystem. That's our ideas, and that's what we're going to work on. And of course, uh, when we think about uh, Basel changes that we want to do, our focus would be on, yes, on, on supporting the community. There are some ideas that we have uh, that we will probably, that are already formed. One of them is just better style our KPI. That's our accessibility point. Uh, hopefully other accessibility points that we have. Remote execution API is something that we will look in, in expanding as well. Uh, the, uh, and then, of course, tooling around this. So Starlock tools such as Profiler or Debugger, Style Guides, Linters, things like that, 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 that will probably be uh, important for the ecosystem as we go along. And one other big project that we are we are hoping to continue working on is, we call it Stargazing. This is it's a cute name. The idea being that we have a lot of native rules, as you know, the, the rules, the code of that is, is in Java. And we, we want to at least make sure that they move to the same APIs as the Starlock rules are. And then it's just kind of, it's one big refactoring we'll probably do around this year or so, where we'll take all this, all this code and, and use the same APIs as Starlock used. And then after that, we'll, we might just move them to Starlock or not. We'll see about that. But the idea being that the API is the same, and there's no, no more of these holes in the API that native rules can, can use, but Starlock can't. So that's a, that's a hope. Uh, so these are some directions we are already outlined for ourselves and in which we execute. But of course, basically, this is, basically the system is you, right? You here are what makes Basel strong, right? That's why we are coming, that's why I come to work every day. Uh, that's why the team probably comes to work as well, every day as well, hopefully, and there's also the, this ecosystem is here, Google is here, and we are supporting all the software engineers delivering great, great things for, for the whole world. So basically just tell us what you need in this conference, what we want to do is help you, and just th throughout these two days, just be there, talk to us, talk to me, talk to John, talk to other engineers, and uh, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, John, Dimitri. So of course, we've got some time for questions. Uh, I expect there'll be lots of questions here. Oh, they're already lining up. That's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So you know, I hear you saying essentially that the message is that 1.0 is the foundation for the community to start building upon. And we're very much eagerly looking forward to the community building on the foundation we've laid. Um, so I think we'll go with questions. And if anybody needs uh, a mic, I'll just run out and go. Uh, go ahead. Remember to introduce yourself. And go ahead. Hello, I'm Benjamin. Uh, so if I recall from the uh, Basel roadmap, say circa 2016, uh, there was uh, a point on there about like basically merging uh, Blaze and Basel, right? Making making it so that Google is actually using the all all the code that Google is using in Blaze is open source, right? Uh, is that is that still a goal? Uh, uh, because it seems to me that that effort has kind of stalled, uh, and I see things like tests becoming closed source because there's test frameworks that aren't open source, uh, and you know, will there be a day where there's non Google committers to Basil itself? Want me to take that? Sure. I, okay. yeah, right. The uh, I think our if you look over the trend, the trend was to open more and more things. Maybe there were some reversals of that, but I don't think they had a lot of them. There is a lot of things in Blaze that are that just don't make sense to open source, like things that you know. We have an internal service that we connect to, and 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 this is. I guess the thing that really irks me is is tests. Sure. Because, because like there's you know right. I infer that there's extensive tests of like the C plus plus stuff, and and like it's very hard to develop a project if you don't have access to the tests, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I I I would say. Um, I mean, speaking of fail failures, I, I think we haven't gone as far as we had hoped in 2016 towards this sort of convergence. I think in some respects, though, uh, some of the things that Dimitri talked about earlier are pointing in that direction. So one of the things, uh, one of the blockers 
to getting to the point I think you want to see is that the native rules we use in, in Google for historical reasons are, are not always the ones that we see externally. And by refactoring these APIs to make the APIs basically the same for Starlark and for native rules, I think that will enable us to open source more tests, enable the divergence that is kind of getting in the way here to be less of an issue. Uh, I will just add that we, we actually see things in the other direction, if it makes you feel any better, that we have uh, blocked changes in Google because they have broken Bazel uh, users in some way or other. And we are, you know, we, it happens in both directions. So we feel the pain in some respects uh, in the other direction too, if that helps. I, I guess, that, like, you know, it's just like Google, 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 right? <laughs> Uh, like Google feels pain. Google is doing stuff. Yeah. Well, we we uh, I hear you. I think one of the thing messages we're trying to send is that um, the we realize that our our time is uh, not infinite. So we're what we're investing in. Uh, in particular, going forward, is uh, the rules ecosystem, the extensibility parts, we want to be as open as possible and as vibrant as possible. And that's where we're going to focus our efforts. That's not to say other parts of the system are somehow less open, but th those are where our investments are going to go. And hopefully, you will see less Google, 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 and more, hey, uh, Rules Scala is owned not by Google. Rules Kotlin is owned not by Google. Other parts of the system are owned not by Google. Remote execution engines not owned by Google. Um, those are all, I think, good things, and uh, we want to enable more of those. So um, I'm guessing it, we're not going to get all the way where you'd like us to be, but we're trying to do better. Oh, well, yeah, thank and you. Uh, feel free to reach out to me during my office hours or uh, find me, and we can talk more about that. Thanks. Hi, my name's Christian. Uh, I wrote uh, Rules PyGen because Python is painful, like extremely painful. Um, and I actually have a different question about workspace rules. It feels like workspaces just get out of hand, and so you end up including BZL files, and then like those include BZL files, and then you add a new Git repository, and all of a sudden things broke because some dependency uh, is not correct. Any plans to make that workspace a little cleaner in some way? Sure. So I think one. Uh we definitely, the workspace story is one of those probably stories that Jeff would cite, Jeff Atwood would cite as uh, one of the failures, or rather not complete failures, but I think that's something that could have designed better. It's been a learning experience. It's been a learning experience. It feels Thanks. like the engine in the picture from Jeff Atwood's talk at the moment. At least yeah. mine does. It does. It does. There are it some does. parallels. There are some parallels. We don't, have, we don't have bricks on top of plastic buckets, though. I can assure <laughs> you we don't actually do that. <laughs> right. So I think... Uh, my view on this is is that what we really was was kind of trying to we're trying to design there is a package manager, but the package manager is uh, is a very difficult thing to design, right? So I think shorter term, what we were trying to do by 1.0 is focus on integrations with package managers. All right. Maven and figure that out. Maven figured the package management for Java. Let's integrate with Maven. NPM figured the package management for Node community. Let's use that. And, uh, and of course, uh, that, that, that's what, what, where our focus was. The one thing we're trying to fix for you know, the some of the foundational pieces of the ecosystem, uh, we are trying to fix through the federations, through the, uh, well, you don't have to, like, you will have a canonical workspace that you just load and use, and that's how you get all your dependencies. That, that was, that's our hope with the federation. Uh, in terms of, and we'll say more about that. We'll say more later. about that in, in the talk later, later today. Florian will do the talk, uh, and then the um, fixing the whole workspace story is something we would still want some feedback on. Do you want to actually embed the package manager in Basil? Do you want to do something else? Do what? What is kind of? It's, it's some feedback we would like to get from, from, from this community. And also, I think the, the community can also take action, in fact, because we know there is a lot of integrations, package managers. There is a lot of things we could, even with the current APIs we have, do through style guides, maybe, or through some best practice, or maybe through some tooling. So I also welcome the community participation in that and kind of figuring out the better way to uh, uh, to handle those external dependencies is, is something that, that we would be interested in, in hearing from you guys as well. Thank you. Remember to uh, introduce yourselves when you uh, come up. Hi, uh, my name is Keith Smiley. I work on Bazel at Lyft. 
Um, so after a few slides you had here, I just wanted to hear if there was kind of an update on what the state of Android is and what the kind of long-term plan is there. So kind of two related things, I guess one is you mentioned maybe the native rules won't move out as, as much as <coughs> have been kind of stated or talked about in the past. And also like the possibility of Rules Kotlin being owned by not Google. Just kind of want to hear if there's like a updated plan because there were some roadmaps at some point. Well, where, Rules yeah. Kotlin is not owned by Google Car uh, already. It's org, but yeah, it's written by somebody else. Sorry, but so, I, well, I guess the assumption in the roadmap was that eventually like Google might drop the internal Kotlin rules. I'm just kind of curious if there's like an overarching update on what's happening with Android. Yeah, I guess the, the short answer about the, you know, th there are Google divergences and not because there's anything nefarious going on. There's history that we have to deal with. And we don't think our users outside Google want to deal with that history. I, there, there are also negative side effects, but I think there are valid reasons for doing that. So um, uh, let's see, that's, that's Kotlin. Android generally, I can say a few things. Uh, one is Android is obviously very important to us. Uh, we have a whole team, which is not our team actually in Google, which uh, supports the Android rules. And if you look at the commit history, you may notice that. Um, uh, the Android rules have been migrating uh, to, uh, to Starlark, uh, for those of you who have been paying attention. And uh, in fact, I think the largest rewrite of native functionality to date in the Blaze slash Bazel code base is in Android. Uh, the rules code is essentially identical, with a few, few asterisks here and there, between Google and the rules we make available in Bazel. So we've been actually, I think, pretty actively uh, you know, moving, the star, uh, the, moving the Android rules to Starlark to enable you know, others uh, to add on those if necessary, keeping up with the, the many, many changes to the Android platform, which you're probably painfully familiar with. And we'll continue to do that. So that's important. I mean, if you have specific Android questions, that might be better to take offline. But it's it's that's an area of active development. We have a whole team Thanks. working on it. So, yeah. okay, let's take the uh, question from the balcony. Uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Christian Gruber. I'm actually the maintainer of the Kotlin rules. So timely. <laughs> there you go. Um, wow, from from so, the from the sky. Yeah. Uh, so the. I had a related question. Um, like, I'm intimately familiar with this process of like the Android Starlarkization of the rules and the whole process of the Kotlin rules and the internal, external split. And as an ex Googler, I'm also familiar with how hard it is to do open source when you have like the size of Google three code base and you have to test and do all of these things. What I'd like to see, and I'd like to get your comment on, is the process around roadmaps and communication externally and how that all works. So when the roadmaps for the Kotlin and Android rules dropped, it was amazing. We were like, yes, we have something to sink our teeth into, especially companies like Square who are trying to migrate and figure out how all of this plays out into our planning and budgeting of headcount. How can we work together better to have roadmaps sort of more frequently updated if there's slippage, like see that so we can have more interplay and is there something in the process that we can improve together? Because we're obviously willing to contribute, but we'd like to see that flow so we can adjust. Does that make sense? Is there a yeah, comment yeah, on that? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely, I think I hear you. Uh, I think one of the things we realize is there's sort of a continuum of rules um, uh, uh, governance ranging from, this is something that's pretty important to Google, it's native code, um, uh, we're making it available, but we, we acknowledge it's, it's often difficult to extend, we'll try to improve that uh, extensibility bit, but, but it's, 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 it's not going to be an area that's going to be easy for others to add on. There are other rules that are uh, totally developed uh, outside of you know, our team, which is great, uh, but maybe not they're kind of hobby projects. And then there are, there's, there's work like Christian's, which I think is super serious, super high quality. And we, I don't think we've done a great job differentiating these different classes of rules and the degree to which the roadmap may be totally owned by Google, essentially, uh, totally open, uh, totally non-Google, or maybe shared. And, and I think we have to acknowledge those distinctions. And I would like post Basel 1.0 to improve our, uh, I mean, uh, in general, you saw a lot of stuff about the rules ecosystem. This is a super important focus for this, and I think you've raised a good point about distinguishing the roadmap ownerships and expectations, and, uh, and I also I think some quality distinctions in, in terms of level of support, you know, best practices. We want to make those distinctions. We want to make them public, and you know, we may have like change our, our GitHub repo setup to make those distinctions clear. So all of those things are on the table. Uh, I don't know, hope that helped. Yeah, it, I mean, that's 
great and on point. Uh, I guess the only thing that, that feels missing there is when we see slippages and things in the roadmaps, mm -hmm. like can we get a better iteration cycle on the planning communication? Because we all understand that projects go weird and there's internal pressures, but is there a way that we can get sort of more ongoing commitment to communicate out when those plans change, when things don't look like they're going to land the way they think they yeah, are? Yeah, well, I, I think you deserve that. And I think, yeah. I, I, I think the reality is some roadmaps are more aspirational than others. <laughs> and I think yeah. we need to acknowledge that. Yeah. And, 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 and I think in some cases we have kind of an advanced right. understanding of that distinction and just make that clear. Yeah. And, and there, are, there are going to be ones that we're going to be super uh, vigilant about committing to. Great, we sh you should hold us accountable for those. There are others that I think are more like, here's what we want to do, here's some tentative dates. You better not bet a business on this. If you do, maybe fork them or something. I think we need to make those distinctions. That'd be great. Uh, That'd be helpful. But I, I, do, I think it's going to vary from rule set to rule set, owner to owner. And that we makes need sense. to make that distinction clear. So. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I think there is also some uh, room of improvement in, in the processes, in how we communicate on GitHub, may, maybe making sure that, say, if it's a Google team that's open source the rules, we can make that easier for them so it's easier for them to you know, communicate these things. I'm sure it's a, we can think about ideas in that direction as well. Because ultimately, it's all about you know, GitHub and code. It's, the proof is, is in the code. So if you don't see commits happening, well, looks like it's slippage, right? But yeah. But people I, need to plan. Of course, but people of course need to plan. Right. Yes. So, yes, yeah. of course. So we have time for about two more questions. Thanks so much. Introduce. Hi, my name's <clears throat> my name's Paul, um, Stack Build. I'm wondering if you can give us an update, and this question kind of dovetails on some previous ones about recursive workspaces, because it seemed like there was some interest, right. but that stalled out. Yes. So I'm kind of curious what the thing uh, is. I can give is. you a longer answer in the uh, you know in the break, whatever. I it's one of those questions like, why don't you just? Why don't you just do recursive workspaces? Well, it turns out the semantics of workspaces is, as you know, okay. acknowledging the failure kind of thing, is it's been overly complicated. Workspaces are essentially imperative code. Because every time you have a workspace declaration, like the, the remote repository declaration, you change a global state. Which means that when you do try to do recursive workspaces, it's basically kind of the first declaration that you encounter as you recurse down the workspace tree wins. So let's imagine you depend on, I know, product buff, whatever version. And some, some dependency introduced, suddenly there's dependency on product buff. Now suddenly, you know, you, your dependency can break you. You don't know what the dependencies are anymore, right? So this is the management of the simple idea of let's load workspaces recursively and why, why don't we just is, is just it will cause pain. And what needs to happen here is rethinking of the whole approach. This is a package manager we're trying to build here. Package managers are hard to build. So if that, that's, a, that's a short answer. We, we just think that this simple design we had is a bad design. It wouldn't work. It would be, cause a lot of pain. And we can talk about ways to, you know, to fix that. Yeah, I, I think our, our failure mode here, being confessional, is um, we said, yeah, let's just do recursive workspaces, clearly the right thing to do. And then we realized, oh, right. yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's have a longer conversation around that. We, we have a lot of thoughts, but right. that, that simple declaration turned out to be too ambitious. Hi, I'm Eric from NVIDIA. Uh, I've got a question for you about CUDA. Um, I know it's come up that you know, various projects are incorporating CUDA and they're doing it in different ways. TensorFlow is kind of like the granddaddy that everybody goes to. Um, but there's been discussion about making CUDA a first class citizen and there's been some talk of a roadmap. Um, you know, we're looking at our own internal way to, to take care of things. And there was maybe a hope that the community would solve something before you guys got a chance to get to it. And I was wondering if there's a roadmap for that, what your plans are, if maybe the right way to addressed is to go to a one-on-one -on -one today, tomorrow. That's fine, too. Um, I, th I would say uh, TensorFlow is, is, you know, sort of its own open source project. It's doing its own thing. Uh, we're glad they're using Bazel. Um, it's not, we don't, our team does not necessarily view their use of CUDA as, a, as, as, as the roadmap or the model or the team's thing. It is a project. And I think if uh, using the TensorFlow's use of CUDA as a, as a model is not working for other, other folks who want to use CUDA, that's an opportunity to do something new. I don't think the TensorFlow team will care. 
uh, they're going to use what they use. And if, if it's good enough, is the more generic thing say is good enough, they might adopt it. So um, it's not an area I think our team is going to invest a lot in, as it's a short answer. Uh, we would love the community to come together and do the right thing here. And, but but I, I don't think you should wait for like TensorFlow or, or us to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I, I definitely agree too. Here's one thing that sounds like something that community really, really strongly contribute. A lot of people use CUDA. We have a, a lot of APIs in, in the C++ uh, world to support CUDA. Maybe they're not good enough, so talk to us if that, that's the case. But then dri the driver probably is, is the, the users, right? So people like you, people like other folks here in the, in the ecosystem who can come together. And here's a good way to support CUDA. And we, we, we will be very supportive of that. We will, you know, we will see what we can do to help you as well. But yeah, this is, we, we are not, frankly, we are not doing CUDA in Basel team. Thank Excellent. You. <clears throat> Thanks so much, everyone. So uh, I just want to give a big round of applause for John and Dimitri. <laughs> Thanks so much. I shouldn't upstage you. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just want to cover one bit of uh, housekeeping. Make sure to sign up for office hours out at registration if you would like to ask questions one on one with Basil team members or uh, um, you know anybody listed, myself uh, or John or Dimitri. Uh, we're going to take a break right now for about 25 minutes and uh, there should be some snacks and some coffee and tea and other refreshments out there but make sure you come back at uh, about 10:25. we're going to try to get uh sorry at 10:55. we're going to get started right away thanks everybody and see you in uh, 25 minutes thank you